Amen. If you have your Bibles tonight, the book of Psalms in chapter 11. We'll start with verse 1. Psalms chapter 11 and verse 1. And the Lord put I my trust. How say ye to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For lo, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privily shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? You may be seated. Just a little backdrop of where David is at. This is a time in David's life where he is fleeing from Saul. Uh, Saul is after him. You know that uh, Saul is jealous of David. He's wanting David's life because he feels that his uh, kingdom is threatened by David. We know and understand that Saul has disobeyed God that the kingdom has been rent from him and the kingdom will be David's according to the word of God and his anointing and uh, so you know basically Saul is doing what any wood king would do he is fighting to protect his own fighting to stop that which would come into place because he would want his own sons to fill that position but it's not what God does, and, or not what God wanted. God did put Saul in charge, but Saul made a decision, did he not? Saul made a decision to do what he thought was best, rather than to obey the Word of God fully and completely. And so we figure tonight, as we begin to look at this, I think about what David said when he said, In the Lord put I my trust. When you look at the Hebrew. The word trust simply means to flee to, to flee unto, or to take refuge. So what David was saying is that in the Lord do I find or do I flee unto my refuge. It's a very strong statement in a time of trouble that David looks all around what is going on in his life and he says, Lord, I'm putting or I'm coming to you because you are my help, you are my strength, you are my deliverance. If we were to look in the word trust up in the Webster's Dictionary, according to Mr. Webster, aren't you glad I looked it up? According to Mr. Webster, the word trust simply means that we have confidence in the integrity of a person. And so those meanings of the word trust are very similar. Confidence. It exudes from both of those things. When David is saying that he's fleeing to the Lord, he is exemplifying confidence in his life or confidence in his God that says, no matter what comes along, I believe you're going to help me. And when we say that we trust somebody or when we look at the someone and say, well, I trust you, I don't have any problem. We're saying I got confidence in you as a person your track record, the way you've acted, I believe that you're going to continue to go in that path. That's what trust means. And, and you know, any relationship cannot survive without trust. There's got to be a trust factor in the relationship for it to prosper. You take that away and you won't have anything that will last long. Because if you can't trust your spouse... It's a heyday for the devil, is it not? The devil fights and the devil battles and the devil causes things to come to your mind that are not necessarily true, but yet he'll continue to do because our trust has been damaged. Trust is one of those things that is hard to, to, to get, but it's easily damaged if we don't take good care of it. Trust is one of those things when people trust us, we should put it in a vault and we should protect it with everything and every, uh, uh, any way that we can oh, live and work to protect that very thing that we've built. We need to do that because there, that issue is one thing that people just, if they say they can't trust you, it'll always leave doubt in the mind. Uh, no matter what you do to recompense, it'll always be there. So trust is very important to a relationship and trust is important in that relationship with God. 
It's very easy for us to say that we trust the Lord, is it not? You know, uh, it, what about God is there not that we can trust? I mean, the Lord is trustworthy, is He not? He's done nothing to violate that feeling. He's done nothing. Uh, his integrity is as great today as it was in the beginning. God has not changed His Word. The Bible tells us that God cannot lie. Uh, and, and we understand that God has not lied. That God has not painted with a broad brush. That God has not uh, used the truth to manipulate it to make it say what He wants to. We understand that the Lord Jesus Christ is truth. Do we not? In the, begin, in the Bible, in the book of John, in chapter 1, it tells us, in the beginning was the Word, and the was, Word was with God, and the Word was God. And all I'm saying tonight is that Jesus Christ is that Word, He's that truth, and He's that trust that we find uh, in, in Him that we can serve Him. We've entrusted our souls to Him. We've entrusted our lives to Him that we will follow Him. Have we not? Trust is something that we have to have in serving God. Absolutely trust is one of those things we need when things are going wrong. How many times when, when people have looked at you in the midst of hardship and they said, trust me. It's hard to trust ourselves in hardship, is it not? When things are going wrong, it's hard to trust ourselves, much less to trust anyone else. But we understand that the Lord speaks that very word to us, not only in the bad times, but in the good times. The Lord speaks that word to us that we are to trust Him with all of our heart. We are to trust Him with all of our mind. We are to trust Him with all of our soul and not begin to doubt and to fear what the enemy is going to do, but understand that God will bring us through some way, somehow, that you will make it if we trust in the name of the Lord. David said, How are you going to say to my soul, Flee as a bird into your mountain? He said, Because if you tell me that, he says that the wicked, they've bent their bow and they make ready their arrow upon the string that they may shoot at the upright in heart. If you were wondering maybe what David is talking about, if you go to Psalm 64 and 3, you would find that what David is talking about is the bitterness of words and how that people were attacking with false accusation and the bitterness of words. I'm going to tell you, friends, that, you know, we had that little saying when we were growing up, sticks and stones may break my bones, but your words can't hurt me. Well, that may be good for the little child, but we understand as growing up and children understand it too, that words do hurt. That bitterness in words, they're soaked into the soul. They're ed and they're etched into the mind and they're inscribed upon our hearts the words that people say. And David is under attack. He's under the onslaught. The enemy is sore after him. Just like the enemy is after you today and after me today. The enemy is after us with the bitterness of words that he hurls accusation, that he hurls all of these things that are hard to be believed uh, toward you and I, that we would just faint, that we would just give up, that we would just turn our back on the Lord. Even the enemy would say, well, what has God done to help you lately? And I would say, well, what has it God done, amen, to get us out of the mess that we're in? What provision has it God made to help us in our time of need? God's faithful to the letter, friend. God is faithful to you and I to help us in our time of need. When we're unable to help ourselves, uh, the Lord is faithful unto you and I to bring us through the circumstance and situation that we are in. You see, David was riding in the midst of trouble, but he was saying, listen here, I understand uh, that I'm having a hard time, but look at my opening statement is that in the Lord I put my trust. My confidence is not in my own flesh. My confidence is not in my friends, uh, but my confidence is in the Lord above because he will provide. The Lord has spoken of himself as being a provider of his people. 
we understand that as David is going through this time and looking, there's also a, a civil unrest that is going on in this time period. Because David looks and he says, If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? I want you to understand that hope and faith are built on the foundations of trust in Jesus Christ the Lord. Hope and faith. They're built on that very foundation, friend, of trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. This day that is being described is not a lot like, or it is a lot like, the day that we live in. There's a lot of civil unrest. There's a lot of things that are going on. Wall Street's acting crazy. You mess with people's money, you mess with their emotions. You mess with people's things, you'll get a rise out of them. You can do a lot of things, but you mess with people's money. You mess with the wrong thing. There's a lot of civil unrest out there today. There's people in our own land that they say that militias are rising up right and left. That There's as many or more militias today than there's been in, in the longest time because people see the values of what America has been slipping away. We see today that civil unrest is caused because there's not a clear, concise choice from the leadership today about who we need to be or, or, or who we need to follow. We're apologetic. The United States has never been apologetic for being a leader and being a beacon of freedom throughout the world. The United States has always been the defender of the weak to go in and help those against evil forces that could not help themselves. We've always been the good guy, but now we're apologetic. There's civil unrest, friend. Our Congress don't know up from down. They're more worried about being politicians and satisfying the needs of politicians than they are worried about being Americans. Their desire is not to please or do the will of the people. And that is obvious because the people are thinking one way and Congress is doing another thing. There's an agenda going on and we're not going to get into that tonight. But can I tell you what is happening is causing a lot of unrest, not only in the United States, but in the other countries of the world. There's a lot of unrest that is going on. They're saying we ought to do this and we ought to do that. I feel like we need to take care of business at the house. Amen, and we get business taken care of at the house, then you can take care of other things. But if we don't get our own selves straightened up, the foundations of who we are as a nation are going to be destroyed and it'll be hard to ever rebuild them again as they were. And this is what David is asking. If the foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? What can we do? I can't barge into the White House tonight and tell our president that I feel like the decisions that he's making are not best. I can send an email, but he probably won't never get to him. You can email your congressman and your senator, and they'll probably pay it no attention unless it's an election year. But then it's only lip service. What happens? What are we going to do? Should the foundation of what we know crumble beneath us, what are we going to do? That's what David's asking. What can the righteous do? I began to think about this. What can, the, what can we do? Is there anything that we can do? Are we helpless? Are we without a solution? Are we without a way? that we can make a difference. There's one word, friend, that is the most powerful word that could ever be invoked in the life of a Christian apart from Jesus Christ. And that one word is pray. I want us to understand tonight that prayer has not lost its power. I want us to know that prayer has changed the hearts and minds of great men. It may be attributed to various and different things, but I'll tell you today that prayer of men and women down on their knees seeking the face of God with great sincerity has changed the course of people's actions time after time after time. We've, hear, we've heard of stories and we've heard of things how that God miraculously moved. Why, you can tell things yourself how that you felt 
that the Lord or, or that a circumstance was going to overtake you and you prayed about it and God began to move and God began to do things on uh, the other side and He made it work out. Can I tell you, just because we've got a man elected to be the leader of this nation, he's not greater than God. His will does not go above the will of God. His mind is not negligent of who God is. God can cause the hardest of men to accomplish His will. I'll tell you tonight what we can do if the foundations aren't as crumbled beneath us. We can call upon the name of the Lord and see what God will do in the midst of a perverse nation. Uh, should God, amen, hear the cry of His people about walls falling down around a city, it's because they called upon the name of the Lord. It's because they obeyed Him. For six days they walked around and said not a word, but on the seventh day the last time they went around they lifted up a joyous shout unto the Lord uh, amen and God caused walls to fall around the city uh, is it because a man stood up uh, in the midst of a congregation of people and stretched his hands out over a sea and it parted hither and thither and two million people walk across the seabed on dry land what happens when the foundations crumble the children of God call upon Upon his name and God provides for his people because we're not built upon the constitution uh, we're built upon the word of God and the Bible said the gates of hell shall not prevail against God's word we shall overcome if we'll trust in the almighty power of God what are we going to do and you say, that's what you always say, just pray. But if prayer loses its power, we've lost our faith. If prayer has lost its ump, we've lost our ump. We've lost our desire to call upon the name of the Lord. We've lost our belief that God can do anything but fail. We think about that scripture in the New Testament that the Bible says the Lord is able to do exceedingly and abundantly, abundantly above all that we ask or think. Boy, that's good stuff, is it not? But can we finish it? There's more to that verse. And the rest of that verse says, according to the power which worketh in us. Come on here with me now. I know God can do anything, but God has expectation out of me too. There's a power that worketh in our life. There's a power of the Spirit of God that abides in our life. Should we get weak and should we become indifferent and should we uh, begin to doubt who the Lord is, then that power is not going to work in our life because we've chained it up, because we've bound it in our own soul and we refuse to let the Lord do what He needs to do. But I will tell you tonight that God will work it all for your good. Hey man, if the power of God is alive and abides in us, what are we going to do when hell breaks loose? Uh, hey man, we're going to call upon the name of the Lord and let the Lord lift up a standard against the enemy. Hey Amen. Because my Lord said that he'd build a hedge about us that the arrows of the enemy could not penetrate. Uh, can I tell you tonight that God is faithful and you can and put your trust and your confidence in Him and know that God will not, He will not leave you. He won't desert you. He will not just leave you lying there in a place of despair and look at you and say, well, you had your chance. If we'll call upon the name of the Lord, if we'll pray, if we'll seek God's face, and God can do great and mighty things in our heart and in our life. I'm reminded of that scripture in the Bible, in the Second Chronicles, if you will. I believe it is. 7 and 14. Where the Lord sent us this word. And he said, If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves. You hear the qualifications? You hear the steps to get to God? He said, first of all, if they'll humble themselves, and the second thing he said, and pray. 
I want you to understand tonight that prayer has not lost its power. Prayer still matters with God. In the, in the technological age, can I tell you, there's no network that can reach another person any quicker than your prayer can reach the Lord. I see, I see signs that say that God answers an email and all this stuff. God's been answering prayer ever since He instructed mankind to call upon His name. He hears it the first time. And people, we may have to do things down here to update it. Update the systems and update the networks and do all. I know a while back they were talking about that the satellite system in space wasn't able to handle all the GPS coordinates and it was going to crash and it was going to be a major catastrophe and all this stuff. Can I tell you, there are no catastrophes in heaven. You don't have to worry about the power going out in heaven. You don't have to worry about things outliving their usefulness in heaven. Uh, amen. God's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And He changes not. Can I tell you, He said, if we'll humble ourselves and pray, Amen, He'll make a difference in our lives. He said, if we'll humble ourselves and pray and seek His face and turn from our wicked ways, He said, then... He said, I, that means he, him, that's first person. Okay, you're not talking about in third person, he's talking about in first person. He said, then will I hear from heaven. And what did he say he would do? He said he would forgive their sin and he would heal their land. What are we going to do if the foundations are destroyed? What can the righteous do? We can pray. We can make things happen. Things can change. We can make a difference if we'll pray. We should never give up on prayer. I know God don't answer everything just like that. But when I've needed it, He's been there. When I had to have it, when it come down to crunch time, He was there. Because we pray. And this is what David is saying unto you and I. I have put my confidence. I'm fleeing to the Lord. I'm fleeing to a place of refuge. Because I believe in the integrity of the Almighty. That He will not swat my plea away. But He'll give me shelter. I'm going to call upon His name. Let, it, let the wicked do what they choose to do. But as for me, I'll call upon the name of the Lord. I believe God to be just and to be faithful. I believe God to listen to my petition. I believe the Lord to forgive me of my transgressions. I believe the Lord to heal the wounds in my heart. I believe the Lord to fill the potholes in along the way. I believe the Lord to make the crooked path straight. Isn't that what John the Baptist said when he was preaching about Jesus Christ? He said he's coming to make the crooked places straight. And that's what God will do for you because that's what Jesus Christ was born to do for us to put us on that pathway of righteousness that leads to Him and a life of purity and holiness in Him. We don't have time to consume ourselves with frivolous things down here. We don't have time to allow the enemy or give the enemy an audience and listen to what he has to say. Need I remind you that the devil is a liar and he can't do nothing but lie. The truth is not in him. He made a choice. He was in heaven. He was in glory. He was a created being of God, but he made a choice. He wanted God's seat. And God said, you're not getting my seat. And God kicked him out of glory. And a third of the angels went with him. My, you ever talked about well, somebody want to have a redo? I bet they'd want to have a redo, but they didn't get one. God is just and God is holy. And prayer still works. Even the simplest of prayers work if they're prayed sincerely. What was it that Jesus said? when he pulled up that little child unto himself and he said except ye be as one of these you cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven except ye be as one of these 
So what are the attributes of a child? They act like a child, do they not? But a child is trusting, is it not? To this day, Riley will get up on places and he'll turn his back to me and he'll say, Daddy, catch me. And just as soon as the me gets past his lips, he's falling. Because he knows that Daddy's going to catch him. That's trust. That's blind trust. He may be a little crazy, but that's blind trust. Because he knows that I've never dropped him. That I've always done everything in my power. I've heard him playing with him some. Made him cry a little bit, but what don't kill you or make you tough. But what I want you to understand is that there's a trust that is inherently built in us. It is. It's built in us. And as a young child, that trust is displayed in, in, in great magnitude. But as we get older, what we think on the side of flesh and the side of survival is that we've got to guard that trust and we've got to guard who we trust. And that trust, as we guard it, it begins to bleed into the spiritual side of life. Can I really trust the Lord? When the Lord tells me to trust Him with all that I have and trust Him with all that I am, can I really 100% put that trust in the Lord? This is the battle that has fought in our mind. This is one of the things that we have to conquer and we have to overcome. But may I tell you, when God entrusted Jesus Christ to come down to this earth and be born as that little baby in Bethlehem, it was entrusted in Christ to perform what His Father sent Him to do. And just as He's redeemed you and I from sin, He entrusted us to follow Him without doubt, to follow Him without speculation, to trust Him, to know that He would not lead us into to, to being uh, 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 overcome, but He would lead us unto liberty. That's the trust that He has put in us, that we would trust Him with everything that we are. And so now it becomes an issue of trust. If a foundation be destroyed, what can the righteous do? We trust God. We pray. We call upon the name of the Lord. We trust Him. A lot of times, there's times in our life when we don't feel Him. We don't fake being saved. We faith it. Do we not? When there's times, I, I felt better at times than I have other times, but just because I didn't feel him like I wanted to feel him, I didn't say, well, I've lost it. I faced it. So what is faith? Faith, faith would be a derivative of what? Trust. Truth. Trust. Dependence. Hope. It all lends itself to that little hodgepodge of words. And I, by faith, I follow him until the next time he puts a spout to where the glory comes out. And my soul is filled with the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I feel him afresh and I feel him anew. So what does that mean? It means in those times I've got to pray. I've got to pray. So now here's the battle. When do we find time to pray? When do we take time to pray? When, how do we turn our mind off to pray? When we pray, how do we keep our mind from wandering and going in a thousand different directions? Can I tell you that when you're not praying, your mind will focus on one thing? It's only when you begin to pray is that your mind begins to multitask and your mind begins to think about, and friend, can I tell you it's a trick of the devil? Can I tell you there's, he's just coming to keep us off of our knees? I remember the other night I took Riley to piano practice and, I was, and, and he happens to practice at a church and I was sitting at the back of the church and I just put my head down, I was by myself and I just started trying to pray a little bit, just meditate on the Lord. And here goes my mind. And, and, and my mind's going this way and it's going this way and it's going this way. And, and, and about four directions in between every one of them ways. It was getting to the point it was so bad I couldn't even hardly think about what I was trying to say. It's just like the enemy come against you and said, you're not going to pray. You're not going to meditate on God. You're not going to do this thing. 
And what do we do? We bear down and we pray anyway. Well, I know what he said, but let me tell you, he's not my master. He didn't redeem me. He didn't pay a price for me. He held me captive. He put me in bondage. He tried to condemn me to hell. But there's somebody that came along my way and set me free by blood divine whose name is Jesus Christ. And he's my master and he told me to pray. So we got to find a way to pray. We find that way to pray. Ladies, when you're cleaning or washing clothes and a spot don't come off, you just don't throw the garment away, do you? You get some shouted out or some resolve or some kind of stain remover and you spray it on there, do you not? And you wash it again or scrub it out, however your technique is. There's more than one way to get a spot out. Everybody's got their own way, and I'm sure yours works best for you. But what I'm saying is is that we don't give up at the first sign of resistance. And that's what I'm saying about prayer. We can't give up at the first sign of resistance. If you can't pray nothing but the name of Jesus, may I tell you that's a powerful prayer. Can I tell you that's powerful? Can I tell you the devils in hell tremble at the name of Jesus Christ? The devil himself quakes at the name of Jesus Christ. Can I tell you tonight you have the authority to use the name of Jesus Christ to call upon him and to get him moving and working in your life. Jesus said call on me and I will answer you. So why do we have to walk around with our head hung down and the weight of the world on our shoulders? David said, I know I got trouble, but in the Lord do I put my trust. They're trying to kill me. They're trying to get rid of me. But I'm not going anywhere until the Lord gets ready for me to go. And I'm going to run to Him. I may have to hide in the cave and I may have to fraternize with the Philistines for a while. But so be it, I'll go where God leads me. Would you have ever thought that God would have put David with the Philistines? But he did. And he found safety there. He found security there. Until the day that God was ready for him to go back to where the Israelites were at. But he never raised his hand against his brethren. He never harmed one of his brethren. Can I tell you, God is able to take care of you in the midst of the enemy's camp if we'll trust in Him. If we'll have faith, if we'll trust the integrity of God. We trust one another to a degree, but we have to trust the Lord in something. But there's no end to our trust in Him. There's no place where we draw the line in trusting the Lord Jesus Christ. We have to allow him. And you know, you know how it is on that potter's wheel, and we're on the potter's wheel. The hard part of it ain't being shaped and molded. The hard part of it's when we go through the fire. They tell me about going through the fire. Is when they put that clay in that jar. That they make that furnace so hot that that clay almost collapses on itself, that they bring it to such a heat to where the molecules will almost melt, but it stops just short of it. And that pitcher, that clay, changes from something that was pliable in the hand of its potter. Now it becomes a vessel that can hold whatever it's to be used for liquids, flowers, sugars, or whatever. Now it becomes something that can be ornamented with the grace of God because it's been shaped, because it's been through the fire, it's been through trouble, it it went to the point of extinction, but it was brought through. And now it's battle-tested and it's ready. And that's what God does for you and I. He shapes us and He puts us in that place and He allows hardships to come our way to test us 
but he won't allow, allow us to be overcome. But hey, he pushes us to that brink to let us know, you know what? If you'll trust me, you can stand anything because I'll never let it overcome you. I'll never let it overwhelm you. You may feel like you're at your end, but God said, I will not allow another thing, not another degree. I won't allow the heat to get any hotter because if it were to get any hotter, it would destroy you. But here, I'm going to make you into a vessel that will hold my anointing. God doesn't pour his anointing into just anything. God doesn't pour his anointing into a uh, sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal. God don't pour his anointing into a broken vase or a jar with holes in it. God pours his anointing into a vessel in which he can use to pour it out and distribute it as he will. I tell you today, it all goes back, here we go, it all goes back to the sacrifice. And who Jesus Christ is and what he is to you and I. He trusts you and I enough to impart salvation unto us. Can we look at it from that direction? He trusts us enough to entrust his holy presence in you and I. Now he's trusting you and I. And therefore we've got to trust him. Through the good and through the bad, he's God. And we came and sang that song that said, The God on the mountain is still God in the valley. That the God of the day is the God of the night. And the God in the good times, he's still God in the bad times. He's God all day. And he's God all night. He's God forevermore. He changes not. Do we trust him? If the foundations are be destroyed, what can we do? If things have gone crazy around you. What are we to do? We put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for Him to deliver us. God will never forsake you and God will never fail you, friend. If we'll just hold on to the unchanging hand of God, Jesus Christ has paid the debt for you and I. He paid it full. And he gave us the opportunity that we have to serve him. Let's don't let our trust waver. Let's don't let our minds and our hearts be distracted. But let's humble ourselves and pray and seek his face and repent of our sins and allow the Lord to move and work in our life that we can absolutely be that blessing, that sanctuary for the Spirit of God to abide in that he wants us to be. Let's stand.